Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Engineering Month session on fire protection engineering. My name is Michelle Farley, and I'm the president and senior fire code consultant at FCS Fire Consulting Services Limited. It is a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about FCS and the very exciting world of fire consulting and engineering. Today, I'll discuss what we do and how FCS developed, and then I'll introduce you to Tom Barcasey, our PNG and certified PMP, our lead engineer and project management professional to share his journey with you. Please note this session is being recorded. Before we begin, we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge that we're coming to you from the town of Innisfil with a treaty land that is steeped in rich indigenous history. The town also is the traditional territories of the first peoples of Turtle Island And also, it is shared between Anishinaabe peoples and Beausoleil First Nation, Chippewas of Rama First Nation and Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. And we thank them for their generations of stewardness. This meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people. And as settlers, we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We acknowledge the four sacrifices that are the foundation of Canadian society today. And we're dedicated to honoring indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples. So let's get started. FCS has been specializing in fire code consulting for over 25 years. I've watched the growth of the industry and the greater need for specialty fire code engineering. And this field continues to grow. We've been industry leaders participating in creating new Underwriters Laboratory of Canada or ULC standards, as well as guiding property managers, building owners and developers to understand their fire code responsibilities and keeping their buildings and people safe. We've all seen what has been happening with fire loss recently. FCS has an important role and over the years, has facilitated keeping millions of people safe. The fire code has become far more complex. In most urban communities, more than 50% of the population is living in multi-residential buildings. Buildings are built bigger, higher, and with more dense populations in residential and commercial buildings than ever before. For many years, we specialized in all parts of the fire code with our primary focus on part nine fire code retrofit, creating plans, schedules of compliance, and scopes of work to bring older buildings to newer standards. We audited buildings, created assessment reports, and turned them over to incumbent building engineering firms and service providers to achieve compliance. As we grew and learned the additional challenges our clients faced, we began to offer a range of rare services, such as fire code management, smoke and odor migration, and hoarding risk assessments. With our unique knowledge base and offerings, we began to be asked to develop fire code alternative solutions for older buildings, as well as to resolve fire department inspections orders and notices of violations, including appearing before fire and building code commissions on behalf of our clients. The more we specialized, the more other professionals and companies defer to our expertise. The engineering required for these projects was complex and it became apparent that most firms did not have fire code engineering specialists. I started contracting seasoned engineers based on the demands of a project for electrical, mechanical, structural. Every project was different. Unique and specialty work that really required diverse team of fire code specialists. Ultimately, it became clear to me that I needed in-house engineers they could use their extensive education and knowledge to work with me to blend their expertise with mine to grow FCS. Here's why. I was auditing a high rise condo in Vaughan. They were under a notice of violation with the fire department for part seven smoke control. I had a good team with me, an excellent fire alarm technician I'd worked with for years, the incumbent's fire alarm service provider, building staff and the property manager. The test should have been simple pull a pull station, watch the elevators recall, fresh air fans turn off, 
pressurization fans start up, dampers open, and the doors at the bottom of the stairwells open to relieve the pressure. Then, test each function alarm, automatic and manual operations. Tests that I had observed hundreds of times. Well, <laughs> the elevator recalled, then it went straight downhill from there. One fresh air controller went off, the other one did not. The pressure fans fired up, but since the dampers did not open, they shut back down and the doors at the bottom of the stairs didn't open at all. Plus, the manual smoke controls at the fire alarm control panel were not functioning. Luckily, this was only a test and not a real fire. We needed fire alarm technicians as well as electrical, mechanical and door contractors to resolve these problems. We sourced all the right contractors, remedied all the deficiencies, but it was extremely clear the complex integration of auxiliary systems was not being tested holistically. Hence, my realization that I needed in-house engineering. I reached out to the PEO, all the engineers I knew, technology programs, everyone I could think of to find experienced engineers with a thirst for knowledge and open to new ideas to lead my integration team. And I was lucky enough to find a great engineer wanting to learn something fresh and exciting. That's how I found Tom. Since Tom started over four years ago, we've refined our integrated system evaluations, observed testing of hundreds of systems, became the first company in Canada to achieve the National S1001 Integrated Testing Certificate Service Provider Certification. And Tom became the first professional engineer in Canada to become the ULC certified to S1001 as an integrated testing coordinator or what we call an ITC. Now I'm going to introduce you to Tom to take you through his engineering journey. Tom? Hi, thank you. I am just going to start sharing my screen here. Okay, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I wanted to pull out a sentence from the website of the National um, Engineering Month, uh, which really was the sentence that uh, attracted me to the willingness to participate here. And it's that it's an annual national campaign featuring fun and inspiring events that will spark an interest in the next generation of engineers. And of course, throughout my 25 year career, I was inspired several times uh, to you know, embark on engineering. And so when I was offered the opportunity to, you know, do the same and give back, I really wanted to jump on that opportunity. So a brief background of my history of 25 years, uh, it started off in a manufacturing environment and specifically on the product development side. And one of the things that I learned very early on in my career, especially in the manufacturing environment, is that an engineer has essentially one of two areas or buckets that they can fall into in a manufacturing environment. And that is on the uh, manufacturing side where the, the sole purpose is to uh, manufacture a product as efficiently as possible and to you know, a defined uh, acceptable criteria. The other side of that, which is where I landed is on the product development side, which is more of a client facing role of course, because you can't develop a product unless you truly understand what the client requires. But that also afforded me some other opportunities to advance in uh, business process development and implementation, contract negotiation, as well as uh, construction projects. Now, more recently, within the last four to five years, I have some engineering and project man management experience in the areas of fire alarm panel retrofit, alternative solutions, which uh, Michelle touched on, and uh, we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into the integrated testing of fire alarm and life safety systems. So a quick reminder as to why you're here uh, in, in terms of fire protection and learning about fire protection. It's an emerging and important field and engineers are the cornerstone of many fire protection and life safety system standards. There are a vast amount of opportunities for all kinds of disciplines within engineering. And this naturally presents a huge learning and crossover opportunity. However, this is dependent on one's uh, willingness and ability to learn and also to contribute. 
And I say that specifically because uh, inevitably what happens when you have that you know, modus operandi throughout your career, you end up meeting like-minded people who are also uh, willing to learn and also willing to contribute. And this is where the crossover happened uh, with Michelle. Uh, inevitably, you meet people with tremendous insight who have a vision of their particular uh, industry and where you might fit into that. And, and of course, um, it's not always possible to know where one fits into it. And this is why being open to learning and being open to contribute, naturally you pull these types of people into your circles and, um, and then they naturally have your best interests at heart. So um, if you're here, you're already looking to expand your knowledge base or to make a career change while capitalizing on your heart and knowledge and learn how your engineering skills and experience can translate into saving lives in the fire protection engineering world. To convey that journey and my personal experience, uh, the agenda for today is gonna be a bit more of a deeper dive into my first career in the electric utility world. And we'll be discussing some crossover engineering uh, skills that I learned and picked up. And then moving into the segue into fire protection, which really was uh, the, the intersection there was project management. And uh, again, some of the crossover technical experience that I gained through that. Then we'll talk about some sample engineering aspects in the industry of, of fire learns. And then we'll, we'll leave on a deeper dive on integrated testing of life safety systems. So this is where it all started. I was a mechanical engineer. I graduated from University of Waterloo. And I had a co-op term at a, a very large uh, manufacturing company uh, worldwide with uh, tens of thousands of employees. And uh, I started as a mechanical engineer uh, in distribution class switchgear. Now, the thing that was very intimidating for me at the time is that I was not an electrical engineer. I was a mechanical engineer, but I had expressed a desire to learn and to contribute. And uh, one of my mentors at the time uh, gave me an opportunity to start in uh, product engineering. And this is what started the, the ball rolling. Uh, it included distribution class switch gear, as well as distribution class fuses, which you can see at the top of the transformers there. And uh, eventually being involved in those types of products naturally uh, lent to being more aware of how those products were being used. And so the next kind of phase of my career after a handful of years being in switches and fuses was substation design and how those switches and fuses were actually being used in the real world. But I have to say that the real fun started in the introduction of smart grid or uh, another distributed intelligence way to capture that. Smart Grid uh, came to light in the general public in the early 2000s. And generally what happened was uh, from my standpoint is that I was helping to design products that were ultimately getting used in a much grander scale than I had envisioned. And I wanted a piece of that. I wanted to learn exactly what environment they were being used in. And as soon as I started asking those questions and opening those doors, this huge world opened up uh, when it came to smart grid. Now I was fortunate enough to work for a very large company who had also made very uh, large investments into smart grid. And, and so the way that I was able to contribute, keeping in mind that I was a mechanical engineer and not a electrical engineer was through project management. So a couple aspects here of smart grid, just to, so we can understand the, the drawing here is that there are, are you know, multiple loads, if you will, that are using electricity. But what Smart Grid tries to do is integrate all kinds of generation aspects, like there's wind, uh, you can see there's solar panels on top of the roofs, there is, um, you know, office use, there is residential use. And eventually what Smart Grid wanted to do was have, instead of centralized intelligence, where there was physical people who were making decisions. So if a uh, line went down or there was a lightning storm. It used to be that there were actual people in switchboards uh, doing some manual switching to you know, divert loads. But what Smart Grid introduced was distributed intelligence, meaning the devices themselves had the ability to make decisions on their own, accumulate data, 
uh, you'll hear the, the word SCADA, which is um, supervisory control and data acquisition. Smart grid and distributed intelligence took SCADA to, to the next level. And my products were being used in this scenario and I wanted to learn more about it. The first uh, part of that was to learn uh, how my products integrated with different systems. And so uh, early on learning about wind farm development projects and again, how our products and my products were integrated in wind farm developments and how they integrated with the, with, with the standard electricity grid. There was also, of course, solar power development projects. And, and of course, the generation of power between uh, solar and wind now needs to be essentially integrated into a grid so that that electricity can be distributed properly to users. Um, as far as some of the crossover skills, I, I'll touch on some of the distribution strategies that eventually translated into the uh, fire protection world. And one of those uh, distribution strategies is what's called a radial distribution system. You'll notice that on the top right, there is a substation which provides power. And in this particular case, there is a singular feeder and which is called a radial distribution system. The aspect of this is that if that feeder was feeding multiple loads, there are you know, some protection devices in front of those loads like fuses that if there is a problem, they can isolate that particular segment and hopefully the other segments stay on. Having said that, if the feeder drops out, then all of those uh, houses would be out of service. So the next level of protection is called the parallel feeder distribution system. And you'll notice here that there is a still a single source, but there is two feeders now that can possibly supply a load and in this case represented by houses. Now you'll notice the X's on those uh, feeders are switches. And by the way, those are the switches that I was responsible for producing, but now being integrated into a smarter type of strategy where those switches can be used to isolate feeders and hopefully keep those houses on in the case of, uh, again, lightning storms and such. Then comes the ultimate in distribution strategies, which is called a ring main distribution system. We call this the ultimate because you'll notice that the substation, which is the source of power at the top, is feeding multiple loads from both directions. Again, those X's are representing switches, the ones that I was responsible for, and then learning more and more about it uh, in, in the distribution strategies. Um, when there is a problem with one of the loads here, the beauty with this system is that the switches now have the intelligence to uh, isolate this, the, the problem. And then the backfeeding of power still means that most of the load can stay on. So this in the you know, electrical grid application world, this was the, the highest level of protection and strategy that one could apply. So now how does all this uh, translate uh, into fire protection and life safety systems? And what was my particular integration? And I mentioned before that it was through the world of project management. Now a brief project management 101 is that the triple constraint is the, the world of project management. This is essentially the uh, overall theme that the triple constraint consists of time, scope and cost. And a project manager lives in this world and they have to understand this world carefully because every single engineering project, whether it is in the utility world or whether it is in the fire protection and life safety systems, engineering projects have a similar hierarchy. There is a project manager who is responsible for uh, managing the triple constraint, but there's also a project engineer who is responsible for technical correctness. And an engineering project is designed to have a natural kind of friction between the project manager and the, uh, the, um, the project engineer. There's always this uh, friction there because the project manager is mainly concerned with, with schedule and keeping things under cost. Whereas the project engineer has the accountability for technical correctness. And, and so there's always this push and pull that naturally translated from the utility world to the fire protection world. Because I had plenty of experience in running engineering projects. 
uh, in, in layman's terms, this is a great way to articulate the need for project management in whatever engineering project is out there. The first slide shows how the customer explained it. The next one shows how the project leader understood it. The next slide shows how the analyst designed it and then how the programmer wrote it, how the business consultant described it, how the project was documented, what operations actually installed, and what the customer was billed for, how it was ultimately supported, and in the end, what the customer really needed. So the essence of project management uh, is to get everybody on the same page, have a single interpretation of what the scope is, and then ensure that all the stakeholders are essentially running in the same line, in the same direction. All right, so let's do a deeper dive into some of the aspects of fire protection. The typical, uh, there's some of the typical main components in a fire alarm system where the control panel is essentially the heart and soul of the system. On the left is a series of detection devices. This is how the uh, reaction starts, if you will. We could have manual pull stations, which requires uh, a manual intervention. And there is detection, which are automatic. You have heat detectors and smoke detectors, water flow switches, which are uh, attached to sprinklers. The, once something is detected, the control panel has a job to essentially notify that there is a event happening. And that notification could come in the way of uh, horn strobes or well-mounted horse strobes. And, and you can see that there is some visual indicators as well. Having said that, there is an aspect of intelligence and decision-making that the fire uh, control panel has to make. So for example, the sample that Michelle cited early on was uh, pressurization in stairwells or pressurization in elevators or where doors have to automatically uh, open. And in all of those cases, the control panel has to make those decisions and trigger certain relays to perform certain activities. We'll uh, do a, a little bit of a deeper dive later on in terms of integrated testing. But in a nutshell, the, the control panel is, is the heart and soul of the switch, which takes in data, which takes in information, and then has to make some decisions. Here is an example of an addressable fire alarm circuit. And you know, when we talked about smart grid, we talked about essentially distributing the intelligence amongst the devices as opposed to a centralized control. In this case, each device has a unique identifier or address. So that is unique to the system. And by and large, the way these systems work is that uh, each device has an address that is being pinged or, or called upon by the controller for a status update. So the controller will say, address number one, how are you doing? Is there any problems? Address number two, and it'll keep going through all the addresses. Now, of course, this happens at you know nanoseconds of speeds, but essentially it is uh, pinging each device uh, that has uh, a smart address to it. In this circumstance here, we're looking at a, a signal line circuit. And I wanted to show this slide for two reasons, because it has um, the ability to have the same wiring, which is distributing the power requirements for the device, but also the data requirements for the device as well. And this greatly reduces the wiring that is involved uh, in installation of this nature. And we usually have essentially two ways of connecting devices throughout a system. There is a class A or a class B connection option. And the input and output devices can be on the same circuit. So why am I mentioning class A and class B? Well, class B here is an arrangement of supervised initiating or notification and signaling devices. The device is on a circuit so that a single open or ground will initiate a trouble event. The open or ground fault may prevent the circuit from operating. And this is much like the radio system that we talked about earlier. So when I spoke about transferable skills, of course, there was a lot of skills I was learning at the time that I didn't know would translate. And you know, through the vehicle of project management, now I was starting to get exposed to uh, fire alarm design aspects and realizing that I knew more about it than I had originally anticipated. 
In a class A circuit, this is much alike the ring or loop style system that provides the ultimate in uh, efficiency. And you'll see here that a break in this line here means that there are some protection devices that will isolate the problem here. But now the panel has the ability to feed from both directions. So now we've got uh, the devices on a circuit so that a single opener ground will initiate a trouble event. The opener ground fault will not prevent the circuit from operating. And again, a transferable uh, engineering skill that revealed itself after getting into the fire protection world after a while. Um, wanted to just show a diagram here that is um, essentially lining out the operations matrix and fire rising fire riser schematic for an alarm installation, a fire alarm installation. And I realize it might be hard to read, but on the right side of that is what's called a sequence of operation. And so what the project engineer needs to do is essentially build in the uh, the, the matrix of intelligence that the, that the fire panel has to have in the event that an event occurs. And there is circumstances that are, for example, if a pull station is activated, here's what the panel has to do. The elevators have to come ground. The pressurization fans need to turn on. So there needs to be some way to communicate that information to the actual designer of the system. And you can see here that there's multiple people, many people involved in the design of a fire alarm system, and they all have their roles to play. Uh, so one of them is to determine what is supposed to happen, what are the devices supposed to do. And then on the left hand side, you'll see a, a, a representation of where all the smart devices are, how they are potentially to isolate any issues. And then of course, this gets taken back to the uh, design team to implement in the field. All right, so let's segue into the integrated testing. Now, of course, there is the design aspect of these systems. And one of the things that Michelle mentioned uh, earlier on was the requirement for engineers to get involved in the integrated testing of these systems. Up until uh, a few years ago, uh, we'll talk about timing, but there was essentially testing in silos. So the elevator people were testing the elevators, the fan people were testing their fans, and so on and so forth. And what the industry eventually um, came to light to was the fact that there was a requirement for more holistic uh, integrated testing, situational or operational testing. And this is where I think that the synergy of project management and engineering come together. The S1001 is the testing of fire protection and life safety systems. And it is a standard for integrated systems of protection and life safety systems. Some of the background here was that it was originally published in September of 2011. It provides the methodology to confirm that two or more life safety systems are functioning together. S1001 standard was developed in response to requirements incorporated in the 2010 National Building Code and the Fire Codes of Canada for commissioning of integrated fire protection and life safety systems. Where life safety and fire protection systems are installed to comply with the provisions of this code, the commissioning of integrated systems must be performed as a whole to ensure proper operation and interrelationship between systems. The 2012 Ontario Building Code then changed its language to say where life safety and fire protection systems are installed to comply with the provisions of this code or the fire code made under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, the commissioning of these integrated systems must be performed as a whole to ensure proper operation and interrelationship. So the theme here is that these tests and these devices are to be tested as a whole and holistically. Of course, the challenge was to implement a universal interpretation of what commissioning was. 1001 was adopted by the National Building Code in 2015. The Building Code changed its language in January of 2020. So effectively what this means is that as of January 2020, the Building Code added language such that any permit that was taken after about the middle of 2020 uh, was subject to this integrated testing and S1001.
Uh, a bit of background in terms of fire alarm system testing. There is a document and a requirement uh, called CAN ULC S537, and it is a standard by which fire alarm companies test the systems, and it can happen in multiple stages depending on the construction timelines, additions, deletions, modifications, or even phased occupancy. The 537 requires upon system completion that the entire fire alarm system is tested. The S1001 not only verifies the operational performance of interconnected devices, it establishes a baseline and situational performance protocol that can be repeated through the lifespan of the system. And this baseline is critical when verifying system performance as system age, because as we know, uh, systems do age and there is maintenance that is required on these systems. And the S1001 establishes that baseline performance so that in the future, if there are any variances in performance, they can always be measured against a baseline. And if you know anything about project management, one of the things that is uh, critical in the planning standpoint of project management is to come up with that baseline from which everything is measured. All right, some practical implementations and examples. This is a picture of a high rise residential tower. And in this tower, there would be multiple systems that need to get integrated together. There would be elevators, there would be pressurization fans, there would be uh, fresh air units that serve common areas. All of these now need to be tested in a holistic manner. As an example, to keep as a visual context through the next through sl a few slides, this is a representation of a stairwell, uh, typically a below grade stairwell, where the pressurization fan would be at the bottom of the stairwell. And then at the top of it, there would be a vent. So as the fire alarm is initiated, the fan would kick on and pressurize that compartment with the idea that if the pressure is higher in that compartment than the common areas, smoke would not be able to penetrate that and provide for safe passage for people to walk through and get out of the building. Um, on the screen right now is a typical fire alarm system test from uh, what we mentioned earlier of 537. And you'll see here that what we were calling ancillary circuits, and to tie it back to the intelligence that the fire panel has to have, once a problem is identified through an initiating device, now the panel needs to make a decision. Uh, what do I do with the elevators? What do I do with the fans in the second level of parking? Uh, what do I do with mag locks? Do I need to operate them? Uh, which fans need to shut down? Which fans need to turn on? So this is a kind of a representation of what that decision-making needs to be. On a typical test report, the annual fire system inspection consists of verifying the ancillary relays, which are essentially the switches that the panel is responsible for changing position. The, these relays then uh, couple onto the control uh, circuit of the device and, and then couple in the required power voltages, uh, sorry, power requirements to operate that device. So essentially the panel needs to determine whether or not these relays open or close. However, the scope of this testing is limited to the operation of that fire panel relay. It's said another way, when these tests are happening and the technician is verifying that these relays are switching position, the standard does not actually require that there's a verification that the fan turned on the way it was supposed to, or that the elevators came down the way they're supposed to. This is not a shortcoming of the fire protection service company. The 536 does not require nor expect the technicians to be knowledgeable with the design specifics of ancillary devices. And just to zoom in on that, there is a standard note on these uh, test reports that indicate the tests reported on this form do not include the actual operational test of the devices unless otherwise specified. So entered S1001. Now S1001 is designed to kind of fill in the gap here that is created by the individual standards. So that way the devices now are tested holistically and in a realistic manner. To zoom in on the actual circuit from the fire panel, we have a representation of a fire panel on the left on the uh, uh, control panel. And then moving to the right, there is a ancillary circuit and a relay that is going towards a pressurization fan. So keeping in mind that example that I cited earlier with the stairwell pressurization, what is happening here is if 
a, a pulse station is activated or a smoke detector is activated, the control panel not only sounds the, the bells and, and possibly the strobes, but it's initiating now the change of position of this particular relay so that that pressurization fan now can be engaged and hopefully turn on the way it's supposed to. Some highlights of the S1001 are that they are procedures to demonstrate the proper, proper operation of integrated systems based on design criteria. The functional operation of input devices in, in simulated operation permitted for non-restorable devices, non devices or where there is harm to persons or systems. The acceptance of other documented testing at the discretion of the integrated testing coordinator, which essentially means that in large systems, there is a large amount of documentation that gets presented from uh, an original commissioning standpoint. The integrated testing coordinator has the ability to decide which documentation they're going to accept at face value or which aspects of that system they're going to do a, a deeper dive and test even further. And again, they are performance-based testing requirements. So I'd like, uh, just keep in mind here that the integrated testing coordinator, the best analogy that I can come up with is um, the, it, it is a project manager who is very focused on the engineering aspect of fire protection, all right? And this is why that world between uh, fire protection and project management came into play. All right, so let's do a deep dive here into a fire safety system and integration. What you're seeing on the screen right now is a very large uh, system, which includes everything from normal AC power to the fire alarm control panel to input devices and uh, ancillary devices. So the question now is how, as an integrated testing coordinator and project manager, do you put together a system like this and analyze it? And the answer to that is starting from a blank slate. The first thing we do is determine what is the normal AC power? Where is it coming from? Then, of course, the heart and soul of the fire alarm control switch, or sorry, the fire alarm control panel. Then we look into what is the alternative source of power, the emergency generator, the input fire detection devices, things like smoke, heat detectors, manual pull stations, hazardous protection monitoring, Signal devices, notification systems, audio, visual, lighting control systems, mass notification systems. Ancillary devices, we touched on that, electromagnetic locks, hold open devices. There could be some pressurization fans and uh, uh, common area fans that provide fresh air. What do the elevators do in these circumstances? There are suppression systems to account for. There are typically water supply systems uh, for sprinklers. And there is fire pumps, there are standpipe systems, and potentially cooking equipment fire suppression systems. There are, um, in most cases, a signal receiving, and that is remote monitoring, and they need to be integrated into the system as well to dispatch help if required. And for larger complex systems, there is building automation systems. Now the job is to figure out how do all these things integrate together? Well, there's the power integration. So there's normal power that is feeding these systems on a regular basis, but there's also the emergency backup. So what happens now when we lose normal AC power? What is the emergency generator designed to pick up in an emergency situation? And then finally, how are all these devices communicating together? Once we have and draw a system map, then at this point, the integrated uh, tester can design a system that is suitable for that particular environment. Moving into how we would test now this stairwell uh, system here is that a typical building has a pressurized stairwell as part of a smoke control system. When a fire is initiated, the pressurization fan turns on to ensure the stairwell remains clear of smoke. And the S1001 testing ensures that the actual smoke control devices perform as designed under various alarm circumstances. When we're looking at a system like this, there is the obvious checkpoints. Does the fan come on when it's supposed to? Of course it does. But now all of a sudden, is there enough air? Uh, and is there enough air to pressurize that compartment to withstand smoke if there was smoke in a common area? 
That, of course, is a minimum criteria, but there's also a maximum criteria because the fire code and the S1001 uh, always try to keep in mind the actual application and the real world environment. It's not good enough that the fan comes on and that there is high enough pressure to keep the smoke out because keeping in mind, people need to use these stairwells. So if the pressure is so high, high in the stairwell that they can't open the door, that is not a safe system. And part of the integrated testing is to essentially evaluate all these potential variables and make sure that where they intersect is still in a functional system and in a safe environment. The fan is observed to turn on and pressure readings are taken to ensure not only sufficient air is supplied, but also that not so much air is supplied that the doors are hard to open. Here are some actual examples that I have faced in the field that uh, I think were worthy of sharing. The screen right now is showing an elevator with a hallway indicator lamp that is off and extinguished. And it turns out the test here, you'll notice that there's a one, that was the ground floor. What I was testing at this particular time was an alternate recall floor feature. And uh, what was involved here was initiating the smoke detector in the elevator lobby and making sure that the elevators were recalled to the second floor in this case. However, the hallway indicator lights were extinguished. And if you were a firefighter walking into this situation, you wouldn't know if the elevators were not working, you wouldn't know what floor they were on and what kind of problems you were facing. So this was one of the checkpoints that I was looking for that the elevator uh, service company then needed to rectify from a programming perspective. On the roof of the building, you're looking at the main intake to a pressurization fan. The fan turned on the way it was supposed to, but as I was taking pressure readings, I noticed they were really low. When we went onto the roof to try to determine what the issue was, it turned out that the louvers here were not opening and they were not electric, properly electrically interlocked uh, into the system. And so therefore the fan was essentially pulling against a solid wall. That causes a number of issues. The first and most obvious is that there's no air getting into the compartment, but also in the long run, uh, there was no telling how long the situation existed for that could greatly uh, overload the motor. Uh, and that's just me showing off how much fun I'm having at the top of a building checking out those pressurization fans. Some other examples of what can go wrong. Dual uh, key elevator, sorry, dual key elevator recall to ground when on an alternate floor. That example that I showed with the elevator recalling to the alternate floor, one of the intelligence uh, aspects that's built into that system is that the codes are written so that firefighters have the ultimate say in overruling any automation that a system has. And so therefore, if the firefighter wants that elevator to come to the ground, that firefighter needs to have the ability to do that. And one of the things that we test for is to make sure that the elevators are programmed properly uh, in that circumstance. Elevator doors malfunctioning with pressurized elevator shaft. I touched on a stairwell example where there was so much pressure that doors might be hard to open. In the case of elevators, when the shaft is pressurized, uh, we've seen situations where the door uh, is being prevented from closing because the air passing through it was too much to overcome and uh, creating an obvious safety hazard for not only people, but for firefighters. I noticed a case where a pressurization fan was running in reverse. The Keeping in mind, the S1001 establishes that baseline performance. And the reason for that, as I mentioned earlier, is that systems need to be maintained. In this particular case, the motor was being maintained as it is on an annual basis. But when the uh, isolation wires were being reinstalled after the maintenance was performed, they were installed backwards. The phase uh, of a, two of the phases of a three phase motor were installed backwards and the fan was running in reverse. So essentially, that fan was pulling air into the elevator shaft. Uh, simple example that Michelle cited earlier was the pressurization fan, which is supposed to be electrically interlocked to a venting door. If that door doesn't open, that fan is not coming on. And there could be various reasons for that door not opening. And it could be as simple as the door striker, either not being wired or being seized. 
a pressurization fan not actuating due to damage relay at the local fan control. And in this particular case, if the fire protection company is doing their testing, the ancillary relay uh, may be switching position and that would create a positive test and a pass test. However, that circuit is designed to now pull in another circuit, which is controlling a fan. And there's a whole uh, um, control relay, or sorry, there's a whole bunch of relays in that control. And in one case, I noticed a damage relay at the local control that nobody would have spotted unless we had done that integrated type of testing. And then finally, an exhaust fan in the loading bay, not connected to a carbon monoxide detector. There was a fan that was in this remote area of the building, but it had not been tied back uh, properly to the carbon monoxide detector. When we tested it, uh, we actually filled the detector uh, to very high levels of carbon monoxide and the fan did not react at all. Um, and then, oh, sorry, one last example is uh, in light of that one, garage fans not connected properly to a fire panel after an installation of a centralized carbon monoxide control system. Bottom line here is that on, Unless we are testing these in a holistic manner, these are the types of small details that can go unnoticed. And when all of these systems are tested in isolation, they may work in isolation, but will they work when they're called upon in a real environment and protecting people in these buildings? And this is why, you know, I'm very excited to be participating in the S1001. Uh, at first, I wasn't sure how many of these things we were going to find. But I can tell you that uh, personally, I have been in over 300 buildings since we have started this integrated testing. And out of those 300 buildings, I have tested less than five buildings that passed the first time. And so that is a stark warning to, to people about the importance of integrated testing, the importance of the roles of the engineers and how they are participating in society and essentially making these environments safe. So what does all this mean? Over the lifespan of a life safety system operation, systems can be modified, devices can uh, are disassembled to be maintained, and components simply wear. It is imperative to establish a baseline performance protocol that is repeatable. The CAN ULC S1001 pulls together the overall intent of the individual standards by ensuring the correct integration between systems requiring operational and situational testing of integrations establishing a baseline performance of the life safety system as a cohesive whole. Michelle touched on this and I would like to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, very proud to have been the very first engineer in Canada to achieve the uh, ITC standard. And on top of that, FCS uh, has, is the first organization and maybe still the only who has achieved the highest level of certification, which is level four, multiple fire alarm control units and transponders serving multiple buildings as a large scale network and multiple integration systems. So just a uh, last slide here, getting a jump start on education. If you're looking to get educated in the way of uh, fire protection, there's some CFAA courses to look at. There's a uh, building code part three courses. And of course there's EPIC training, which I have been involved with in many occasion to provide an overview of what fire protection could look like. So thank you again for this opportunity and back to you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Tom. Since our inception, FCS has come a long way. We became an engineering firm with our C of A to complement and enhance our fire code consulting services. We remain committed to the continued improvement of building fire safety and continue to be leaders and innovators in this area. The fire safety industry has also continued to evolve and fire safety standards and enforcement have come a long way. Standards like the S1001, Integrated Testing of Fire Protection and Life Safety Systems, will help to make new buildings safer from the planning to commissioning stages, plus retrofitted buildings safer as we integrate new technologies with existing systems. This is a significant milestone for the safety, for the fire safety industry. The evolution of both life safety systems and standard means that there are now not enough engineers specializing in complex buildings and fire code life safety of existing and new buildings. 30 years ago, you pulled a pole station, a bell rang, now doors must open and close, fans come on and off, signs light up, monitoring is alerted, elevators recall, automated voice announcements commence. The list goes on and on. 
the opportunities are limitless in fire protection engineering and the need is great. What do we really do at FCS? Bottom line, we save lives. What do you want your engineering career and legacy to be? Thank you all so much for participating today. We were gonna take some questions now and Tom, I think there's one in the chat box that we want to have you answer first. <laughs> Hey, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just opening up the chat box here. So maybe, can you read it to me, Michelle, the one that is of, of interest? Yes, I will. Ooh, just give me a minute here, I'm just pulling it up. Oh, okay. okay. So, sorry, go ahead. The VFT, the VFD question with a PLC, if you can answer that one first, that'd be appreciated. Okay, so VFD with a PLC and pressure sensor inside the stairwell, but is this control system listed for fire and life safety use? How can we tell that? And, and so the answer is yes, that it is listed for fire and life safety use because a variable frequency uh, control is something that is very useful for fans. And when it integrates with a PLC or another device, um, it's supposed to essentially control the frequency to a motor and then allow some variability in introducing a certain amount of air into the compartment. And so when, when you ask, um, how can we tell that? It's because it's there. And, and so when we look at the single line dry diagrams and the fire protection system, for any uh, system, uh, for any fire protection design, if the fan is there and if the VFD is there, then that becomes part of the system that needs to be tested. And so uh, I, to say that it is complicated is an understatement because there needs to be a deep understanding of how these systems integrate. And this very question highlights the need for S1001. Thanks very much, Tom. And just for those questions coming in, you'll see we just answered this is a recorded session and we believe the organizers will be making it available. We'll confirm that. Tom, there's another great question from Matthew and I think you're the perfect person to answer this if there's a path for fire protection engineering for a hydro engineer when your beginnings were mostly involved with hydro. So why don't you answer that question for us? So I've dedicated myself to groundwater and hydrology and don't see much overlap with circuitry. Well, I think that, uh, so I'm not a hydro engineer and I can't speak definitively, but I do know that hydro engineering does require uh, some distributed intelligence and ways to provide ambiguity into systems. And so I think that whether you're talking about electrons or whether you're talking about uh, water, uh, I think there are some transferable skills there. Do we have any other questions that anybody would like to ask? I also just wanted to note that they did note something about uh, about the information being posted and where you can get the session that's being recorded. And Tom, earlier there was a question about uh, strobes and I had answered that in the chat in the sense that there are some impacts to some people with health concerns. However, those can be supplemented, for example, uh, localized for people with disabilities as such as hearing, there are additional measures that can be brought into their particular unit or area. And there are also some compensating measures that can be made for individuals. Typically those are done in a residential setting, but anyone with disabilities under the Disability Act can approach an employer or a landlord or an, even an ownership of a condominium to determine that uh, what types of additional measures could be made for them in order to accommodate any health concerns that they might have. So that is something that can be taken into consideration on a localized basis. I don't know if there's any other questions. So I wanna thank everybody for their questions. We're gonna leave the chat up for a few minutes if there's any more that are coming in. We really appreciate it. Greatly appreciate you being here. So we'd like to thank everyone for attending today. We hope you've enjoyed our session. We'd also like to thank OSPE, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers for organizing NEM this year. Lastly, a very special thank you to all of 
our NAM partners who are noted in the slide that you're going to see on your screen now. Join us at other NEM events. Check out nemontario.ca for a complete listing of all the events this month. We will see you there. Have a great, great day, everyone. Thank you.